So what is an integral, and what does it have to do with the derivative? To begin to understand this, let's start by trying to find the equation for the area of a circle. To start with, you might try splitting your circle into sections and determining the area of those sections. Notice that when you zoom far enough in on the edge of the circle, it actually looks like a straight line, which means that these sections will approach triangles as the number of sections increases. So we unwind our sections and turn them into a shape that will approach a rectangle. By observation, the circumference of our circle is equal to pi times the diameter. So the bottom of our shape is half the circumference of our circle, or half pi times the diameter. Since the diameter is twice the radius, then the bottom of our rectangle is equal to pi times the radius, r. The height of our rectangle is equal to the height of our sections, or simply the radius of our circle. So then, the area of our circle is pi times r times r, or pi r squared. Let's apply the idea of splitting up a shape into smaller pieces to a different problem, the area under a curve. Let's see if we can find the area under the curve f of x equals x squared between the points x equals 1 and x equals 2. Perhaps we start by splitting this area up using rectangles, since we can easily find the area of a rectangle. The height of these rectangles is simply f of x at the position the rectangle starts, and the base will set to some difference x, or dx. As this dx value decreases, we can see the approximation of the area improving. So the true area of this shape is equal to the sum of the area of all these rectangles as dx approaches 0. Because of this, we don't talk about it as a regular sum, it's more what these sums approach, which we refer to as the integral, using an s-shaped bar. We want the integral between 1 and 2, and since we want the integral of our rectangles, it's the integral of f of x times dx. This effectively gives us a smooth sum of infinitely many, infinitely small areas which make up the area under our curve. The final question, perhaps, is what on earth this has to do with differentiation, or the rate of change? The link can be found by looking for a way to go from some derivative f dash of x to the original function, f of x. Or said another way, how can we work out y from dy by dx? The key here is the difference in y, or dy. y is, in effect, equal to the smooth sum of our differences to y. We know we can write the smooth sum as the integral, so the integral of dy is equal to our original function, y. This is interesting, but we still need to work out how to isolate our dy value. Let's see what happens if we try getting the area under the curve of our derivative using rectangles. As before, the width of each rectangle is equal to dx, and the height in this case is equal to f dash of x. So the area is f dash of x times dx. We can substitute dy by dx for f dash of x and cancel out dx. So our rectangles are equal to the dy value we needed. Hence, getting the area under our curve is equivalent to reversing the process of differentiation. Sometimes we refer to this as the antiderivative. If we write this out, it's the same thing as saying that the integral of f dash of x times dx is equal to f of x. We can use this knowledge to reverse our curve, as you're seeing now. But wait, why does our new curve not overlap the old one? Well, when we take the derivative of our curve, we get its rate of change, which isn't affected by its height off the x-axis. Both our curves are identical, but at a different height from the x-axis. We account from this by adding a constant, c, to our result. 